The fool says in his heart, there is no God. We read that statement twice in the Psalms, Psalm 53 verse 1 and Psalm 14 verse 1, double confirmation. So, according to the Bible, who says in his heart there is no God? The fool, the moron, the dummy, the imbecile. Actually, the Hebrew word for fool here refers to someone who's a fool in a moral sense rather than an intellectual sense. It's not someone with a low IQ. It's someone who stubbornly rejects wisdom and correction. Now, when the psalmist declares, the fool says in his heart, there is no God, is he talking about atheists? Is he calling atheists fools? There should be a glaring problem with that interpretation. Namely, that atheism wasn't really a thing in Israel a thousand years before Christ. Pretty much everyone King David ever met would have been either a monotheist, one god, or a polytheist, multiple gods. Atheism, no god, wasn't much of an option, so it seems a bit odd to think that King David was making fun of atheists. And yet, I've seen quite a few Christians quote Psalm 53.1 in response to atheists. So lots of Christians seem to be convinced that this claim is about people who don't believe in God. And that completely, utterly, totally misses the point. Read the relevant Psalms carefully and you'll realize that this claim, the fool says in his heart, there is no God, isn't about atheists. It's about you. It's about me. It's about all of us. And these psalms are teaching a very important lesson that everyone needs to learn. Psalm 53 and Psalm 14 are very similar, so we'll read one of them, Psalm 53. And then we'll read another psalm that clarifies what these passages are ultimately saying. Psalm 53. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and their ways are vile. There is no one who does good. God looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. Everyone has turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Now, if you're a Christian, but you've never read this psalm, this should still sound familiar because the Apostle Paul quotes some of this in Romans 3 where he's showing his readers that we're all sinners. So Paul thinks this applies to all of us, not just atheists. There is no one who does good, not even one. But then David, the psalmist here, turns his attention toward oppressors in particular, people who are oppressing the Israelites. Do all these evildoers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread. They never call on God. But there they are, overwhelmed with dread, where there was nothing to dread. So God eventually punishes the oppressors. God scattered the bones of those who attacked you. You put them to shame, for God despised them. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When God restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Did you catch anything that was specifically about atheists? Psalm 53 begins by saying, The fool says in his heart there is no God, but then it says that we're all sinners, and it goes on to address specific sinners. What's going on here? If you read Psalm 53 carefully enough, you can figure out what David is really saying, but it's easier to spot the meaning in Psalm 10. Let's read Psalm 10 for clarification. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. So, because God stands far away, meaning that he doesn't immediately intervene, the wicked man devises schemes and curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. All his thoughts are, there is no God. Sound familiar? 
is this talking about atheists? Let's keep reading. His ways prosper at all times, so he keeps getting away with it because God hasn't judged him yet. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. As for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. Look at what he says in his heart. He says, in effect, since I've been getting away with what I've been doing for a while, I'm obviously going to get away with it forever. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages, in hiding places. He murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Now that's interesting. Here, the wicked man doesn't say, there is no God. Instead, he says, God has forgotten. God has hidden his face. God will never see it. Still think this is about atheists? Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? Notice here, the wicked man isn't claiming God doesn't exist. He's claiming God won't hold me accountable for my actions. But you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. Psalm 53, Psalm 10, and Psalm 14 all refer to people who say, inwardly, there is no God. And if you ignore the rest of what these psalms claim, it's easy to think that the psalmist is talking about atheists. A closer examination, however, shows that these psalms are about people who sin, people who take advantage of others, people who oppress others, and who think that they're going to get away with it. When someone steals an old lady's purse, he only steals her purse because he thinks he's going to get away with it. If he knows he's going to get caught, he's not going to steal her purse. When someone commits fraud or adultery or murder, he's only doing it because he thinks he can get away with it. If he didn't think he could get away with it, he wouldn't do it. So, according to the Psalms, when we sin, we've somehow convinced ourselves, at least temporarily, at least briefly, at least for a moment, that we're going to get away with it. But there's a God who sees and knows everything, which means that no matter what we think, we're not going to get away with it forever. If you believe in God, you know you're not going to get away with it forever. But you sin anyway, as if you think you're going to get away with it. This means that even if you believe in God, when you sin, you're acting like you don't believe in God. You're acting like you won't be judged for your actions. So, when Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, and yes, even atheists, lie, cheat, steal, whatever, we're saying in our hearts, there is no God, or that God doesn't see, or that God doesn't care. We are exhibiting an internal attitude that we can escape justice. Regardless of what we believe when we're thinking clearly, we have an ability to suppress the idea that we're going to be judged for what we do. That's what Psalm 53 and Psalm 10 and Psalm 14 are talking about. To be clear, 
some people do this far more than others. Psalms focus on people who are doing some really, really awful things. But again, Paul applies this to all of us. If you sell your car to someone, and you completely rip him off and trick him into paying three times what the car is worth, you've said in your heart, there is no God, even if you're a Christian. Now, we could read these Psalms and look around at the world and conclude that atheism is the logical next step in our efforts to avoid the consequences of our actions. We could view atheism as an attempt to intellectualize the inward rebellion that the Psalms draw attention to. In other words, if you're trying to convince yourself that you'll never be held accountable, you can rationalize this by rejecting belief in God. We could say that about atheism, but that's just not what these Psalms are about. These Psalms are making a point about human beings who sin. And that's all of us, not just atheists.